Good morning and you're welcome to COVID-19 360. We are back, of course, to give you some updates. And just gone by was the press briefing and Anita will run you through the numbers. But uh, a bit of review of what we're talking about today. So basically, the compilation of the new voters register has officially commenced. And so we have our reporters on the ground and they'll be giving us up to speed uh, updates on what exactly is happening and whether people are adhering to the social distancing protocols as well as the safety measures that have been put in place. Yesterday, the EC chair mentioned that about seven uh, centers just to make sure that people are adhering to the safety protocols. And so we'll find out more about that with our correspondents shortly. And also, when we get to speak with our experts, we'll find out more about uh, the post-traumatic stress disorder that uh, comes with patients who have suffered from COVID-19. It is very likely, uh, according to research, that we're going to have to deal with another kind of situation, which is patients who are grappling with PTSD. And so is Ghana really ready for this situation? Are there already interventions to ensure that some of these patients uh, who experience COVID-19 are catered for psychologically? And so, so much more on COVID-19 360. My name is Brella Mundi and you are welcome. Anita is here as well, and she'll run us through the numbers shortly. But a quick update, so according to, um, um, you know, the National Health, the Ghana Health Service, pardon me, 390 new cases have been recorded in 41 districts and five regions. And so look forward to all that and more on the show. We'll also give you some news updates as well. Uh, but we'll take a quick break and we'll be back with more. All right, you're welcome back. It's COVID-19 360. And like I said earlier, there's been a new update on Ghana's case count. And so we'll be breaking it down for you just so you know what exactly is happening in Ghana. Also, we'll be crossing over to our correspondents shortly to find out what the situation is like at the various centers as the EC officially has commenced the compilation of the new voters register starting today. And so you find out more of that on the show. Stick and stay with us. But of course, Anita is here to give us the figures. All right, so my name is Anita Ikiak with this is COVID-19 360, but the Ghana Health Service website is yet to update us on the figures as we've been told this morning uh, from the press briefing, but 390 new cases have been recorded from five regions and that is 41 districts. And those regions are the Greater Accra region, which has recorded the highest so far with 217 new cases. The Ashanti region has recorded 140 new cases from 18 districts. The Eastern with 22, Volta 19, and the Oti region with two cases. And so as of this morning, 390 new cases from five regions, and that is 41 districts, have been recorded. 11 regions did not record any cases uh, from the last update. And so when we're looking at the total number of cases that have been recorded so far cumulatively, we have 17,741 positive cases out of 297,591 tests or persons that have been tested, giving us a positivity rate of 5.96. Recoveries or discharges now are 13,268 with deaths uh, standing at 112. The active case Cases now we have 4,361, and these are people that are being managed in the various treatment sites, isolation centers, and also some under home management. For cases that are in severe condition, we have 24 cases, six cases are critical, with four on ventilators. And so, uh, also, a graph was uh, showed on the screens, you know, at the press briefing, and showed that during the 22nd week. Uh, you know, according to the number of weeks that we've been uh, still battling with this COVID-19 pandemic, during the 22nd week, over 25 deaths were recorded just within that week. And that is the highest that has been recorded so far. And from the graph, uh, when you visit the Ghana Health Service website, when it's updated, you can find all of that information as well. And also, when it comes to the active cases region by region, 
The Hafu region has two active cases as of this morning. The Ashanti region has 1,436 active cases. The Buno region with 13. The Buno East has 27 active cases. And the Buno East also has 27 active cases. And when we go to the central region, they have 203 active cases. Eastern region with 191 active cases. The Greater Accra region has the highest so far. That is 2,200 and 45 active cases and so uh, the details that have been given so far shows that uh, 13,268 people have been discharged and 4,351 active cases so far and so that is uh, the details we were able to grab from the uh, press briefing that just went by at the Ministry of Information and so I'll be giving you the figures on the African continent and also globally as the show progresses but right about now news update is ready brother. Absolutely, it is. And just one, um, you know, thing to add. So earlier we had a discussion with the Minister for Tourism, Arts and Culture, where she gave us more information about the Ghana Tourism Development Project, which is a $40 million project that is meant to boost the tourism industry in the country. Just so uh, that moving forward, if we're, our borders are open and people are allowed to come in and visit the country, they will not just visit some, um, you know, regular sites, but there will be uh, you know, projects that will enhance various tourist sites and destinations so people can visit. Now, also, they talked about a grant, a $9 million US dollar grant, which is earmarked to, um, you know, uh, mitigate the factors or uh, the, the effects of COVID-19 on the tourism sector. And so if you're one of those people who is yet to start a business in the tourism industry or you already have started and you belong to an association under the tourism sector, then you should apply uh, for the grant to support your business or cushion you during this COVID-19 period. Just visit the Ministry uh, of Tourism, Arts and Culture website and get more details on that. Coming up now is News Updates. Welcome to News Update on COVID-19 360. The UK's first full local lockdown has been announced in Leicester City. With stricter measures imposed in the city, non-essential shops will shut on Tuesday and schools will close to most pupils on Thursday because of a rise in coronavirus cases. The loosening of restrictions for pubs and restaurants in England on Saturday will also not be taking place there. The health secretary said measures will be enforced by police in some cases. Matt Hancock said the city had 10% of all positive cases in the country over the past week. It comes after the city council reported 944 positive cases in two weeks to 23rd June, about 1 in 16 of the total UK cases during that period. On the 25th of June, authorities in Rwanda introduced total lockdowns in part of the capital Kigali, citing surge in COVID-19 cases. The local government ministry said Kigali had recorded 21 cases in June. As of the time, the decision to reintroduce the lockdown to the areas was taken after consulting the health ministry, it said. Rwanda had reported a total of 850 cases and two deaths since the first person tested positive in March. In a space of four days, the country has recorded over 150 cases, taking a tally of confirmed cases as of yesterday, June 29, past 1,000 mark, according to the Ministry of Health tallies. Incidentally, as much as 101 new cases were recorded yesterday only, out of some 2,498 tests carried out, the cumulative number of tests stands at 140,249. Ghana has justified its decision to embark on a voter registration exercise and conduct the 2020 general elections despite the outbreak of the deadly novel coronavirus in Ghana. President Nana Adodankwe Kufado, in addressing the nation a night before the beginning of the registration exercise by the Electric Commission, said the registration and conduct of elections this year is non-negotiable. As a safety measure, he said, all the 33,327 polling stations across the country where the voter registration will be conducted will have in place the necessary and elaborate protocols. Ace investigative journalist Anas Arumiao Anas says he was driven by the need to protect the public from herbal medicine peddlers in undertaking his latest investigation. The latest undercover work, which was premiered on TV3 on Monday, June 29, exposes quack doctors who sold herbal medicine said to cure the novel coronavirus to unsuspecting members of the public. But in an exclusive interview on TV3's News at 10 on Monday, Anas told host Martin Asiedu Date that the piece is not unusual of him. Health officials in South Korea have concluded that the idea of community forming herd immunity from COVID-19 is wishful thinking. The deputy director of the Korean Center for Disease Control, Hwan 
Kung Hock said the organization had come to that conclusion after analyzing both domestic and international data. South Korea has started antibody tests in random samples of the population to find out the true infection rate within the country. The serology test will examine the blood of around 6,000 people to find out who has immunity to the virus. These tests will be conducted every two months and will be completed by the end of the year. So far, in random blood tests, over 1,500 people officials found that 0.1% of the samples had antibodies for COVID-19. And that's all we have for you for news update on COVID-19 360. And that was news update. Anas is still trending with mixed reviews about his expose yesterday. I saw a very interesting one where... Someone says that, um, you know, they were expecting some serious expose and Anas decided to do Driba Driba. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's how these uh, local medicine uh, people promote their Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, tell us what you think about it as well. Are you part of those people who uh, felt it was an anticlimax or you think that it was very necessary that he did an expose on some of these quack doctors? I mean, my takeaway from that was the fact that there are actually uh, some local doctors who are, are selling drugs that have not been verified by the FDA. Because with Dr. Abdallah, he had a fake uh, FDA registration number. And that alone, uh, you can imagine how many people may have bought that medicine and are using it without the approval of the FDA. It's scary. So again, good job. Uh, to a nurse, Anita. And we're waiting for the, the, the second the, leg the, of yeah, the, the second expose. part. You said, well, Yanko Hiblis. Yanko Hiblis. I saw yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what are the figures for Africa? All right, so on the African <laughs> continent, we're really close to the 400,000 mark. As of this morning, we have 393,479 confirmed cases with 6,643 healthcare workers being affected. Deaths almost close to the 10,000 mark now at 9,882 recoveries at 186,515. And when you go to South Africa, and as always, they're leading on the continent with 144,264. And in South Africa, uh, they are waiting for the Ministry of Health in South Africa to give them the go ahead to start easing restrictions, especially when it comes to level three of the restrictions. That is opening of restaurants, casinos, and people being able to converge in such places, not in huge numbers, but to be able to socialize like they used to do. And so they are looking forward to easing restrictions on that level. And when we go to Egypt, Egypt has 66,754 cases. And Egypt, um, how do you call it, with 66,754 cases in Egypt, they also have come up with a, a COVID-19 drug that they are touting as very effective and it will soon be on the market. And that is according to Hossam Hosni, the head of the Ministry of Health uh, uh, in Egypt. And so uh, hopefully if it works, then it means that that will be some good news for the Egyptians and also uh, people who have co contracted the virus in Egypt. And now in Nigeria, they have recorded 25,133 confirmed cases across 36 states. And as of this morning, the Cross River State is the only state in Nigeria without any case. And Lagos State has crossed the 10,000 mark and that still remains the epicenter in Nigeria and then down here in Ghana as of the last update I'm sure they're yet to update the figures here we now have 17,741 confirmed cases and down here in Ghana as well the registration for the voters register has begun in earnest as people are converging in the various centers to register and to be able to cast their vote on December 7th and now in Algeria 13,500 and 71 cases have been recorded, making them the fifth highest on the continent. And Algeria, somewhere uh, mid-June, started easing restrictions in over 19 provinces. And they're looking forward to easing more restrictions in the various provinces, depending on how the ones they've eased uh, pan out. And Cameroon is the fifth highest on the continent, with 12,500 and 92. Now let's look at the recoveries and see which countries on the continent are doing really well. And South Africa has over 70,000 recoveries. That is uh, a huge milestone, even though they still have a lot of active cases. But 70,164 recoveries in South Africa, Egypt, with 17,951, making them the second highest when it comes to recoveries on the continent. Ghana, 
uh, this morning we've been told that over 13,000 recoveries have been recorded and Cameroon with 10,100 and Algeria with 9,674. Now let's take a quick glance at the deaths and it keeps going high, unfortunately, but Egypt is leading when it comes to this parameter with 2,872 deaths, South Africa with 2,529 Algeria with 905, Nigeria with 573, Sudan with 572. And interestingly, this is the only parameter that when you click on, you get to realize that Ghana is nowhere at the top. And that is uh, good news. Now, let's take a look at what is happening on the Johns Hopkins uh, Coronavirus Resource Center dashboard. And over the weekend, we crossed the 10 million mark. And you can see that the, the figures keep increasing day in, day out. I mean, every second, the figures are increasing. And with just 10 million, uh, you know, over the weekend, and now we are at 10,302,867 confirmed cases globally. And the United States is number one on this dashboard. That is the Johns Hopkins dashboard with 2,590,500 and 82. And President Donald Trump, you know, President of the United States, is touting the number of tests that have been done in the United States, which is over 31 million tests as the highest. And on the other hand, China is also, uh, you know, touting the number of tests being done, which is, they claim is over 90 million tests as the highest. And so which one do we take? Well, the President of the United States, Donald Trump, thinks DS is the best as he claims. But as the days go by or the weeks go by, we will find out which country has indeed tested more. But when we go to Brazil, Brazil has 1,368,195. And in Brazil, there's been protest, uh, you know, against the president. And president of Brazil is always in the news. I mean, Mr. Jair Bolsonaro, he's gradually becoming uh, the talk of, uh, you know, the, the town in Brazil. And people think that the way he's handled the situation in Brazil isn't the best. And so, there's been protests against him that he should step down, especially in times like this when they were expecting much from him. He hasn't delivered. And so there has been some protest in uh, some parts of Brazil regarding the way he has handled the coronavirus pandemic. And then in Russia, more cases are being recorded. And as of this morning, they are the third highest globally with 640,246 confirmed cases in Russia. Now let's go to India and India is steadily becoming one of the hotspots globally as day in day out they are recording cases and their hospitals especially in New Delhi they are being overwhelmed exceedingly when it comes to the cases and new hospitals have been built and put put up just to uh, you know be able to take in all the cases that are being recorded and also in India uh, they are looking at volunteers, you know, who will be immunized with a new locally made coronavirus vaccine in July. And so if that also goes well, that will be some good news for India and also the world at large. Now, United Kingdom is coming in with some 313,470 cases. And interestingly, in the United Kingdom, they are looking forward to, you know, organizing weddings. That is, if you have a wedding coming up, you can now organize it, but just with 30 people. And so now no more big weddings in the United Kingdom and you have to have a maximum of 30 people at your wedding. And even with that, when you're saying your vows, I mean, if someone interestingly said that you have to whisper it. You don't have to, you know, say it like one shout to when it comes to, you know, having weddings in the United Kingdom. But let's look at the global recoveries. And now we have 5,235,908 recoveries globally. And so Brazil is leading. Last week, they, they took that huge uh, step being the first on the global scale. And this morning, they are still leading with 757,811 recoveries, making U.S. now the second with 705,203 recoveries. And then Russia third with 402,778. And then India with 334,800 and 22 recoveries. Now let's look at the global debts. And as of this morning, over 505,518 deaths have been recorded. And for this parameter, the US comes back to lead with 126,000, 
141 deaths. And then Brazil now coming in second with 58,314. United Kingdom with 43,659. And then Italy with 34,744. And now let's look at the global projection. Some weeks ago, most of the time, the projection was uh, just 1 million or 2 million difference. That is when they are making the projections of how many cases were expected to record over time. But now, the projection on the Johns Hopkins website, due to the number of tests that are being done worldwide and also how rapid you know, the, the cases keep coming in, now it is a 5 million difference from the last projection, which was 10 million, and now it is at 15 million. And so when you look down here, you can see the projection here, and it is 15 million on this side and so from what the Johns Hopkins website is projecting maybe by the end of July or even mid July we would have gone past that 15 million mark because more tests are being done and more cases are expected to be recorded due to community spread but this is still COVID-19 360 we're taking a quick break when we come back there's more as our experts are standing by and also we'll be talking to our various reporters on the ground to find out how the registration process is going don't go anywhere keep sending in your messages and we will be back all right welcome back it's still COVID 19 360 and i'll be speaking to uh frontline experts shortly but let me read a, a report that was uh posted on bbcnews.com uh, earlier and this will um you know direct the conversation with our experts so it says that people who were seriously ill in the hospital with COVID 19 would need to be urgently screened for post-traumatic stress disorder the COVID trauma response working group led by the university college london and involving experts from southeast england said that those who had been in intensive care were most at risk. The working group highlighted research which showed that 30% of patients who had suffered severe illnesses in infectious disease outbreaks in the past had gone on to develop PTSD, while depression and anxiety problems were also very common. And so a psychiatrist, Dr. Michael Bloomfield, who is on the COVID working group, said that those patients who had ended up in hospital will have faced a very frightening and invasive experience and coupled with the long-term complications, they will be at risk of stress-related mental health difficulties. Uh, the research says that about 30% of such persons who have suffered severe infectious disease outbreaks develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And so we're going to be crossing over to our health experts shortly to find out if here in Ghana, uh, especially with Dr. Newman, there has been any intervention in place to ensure that a lot of these people who go into intensive care uh, do not come back with some PTSD. And even if they do, what is the solution for that? I mean, do they prepare them ahead of time um, for some of these psychological um, you know, disturbances as well. So we'll be speaking to them shortly and we'll give you more information when we cross over to our correspondents at the various uh, registration centres because the Electoral Commission has officially started the registration for the new voters register. Remember that if you're yet to leave the house, you would require um, a valid national identification authority card and also you would have to present a Ghana passport if you don't have that or else you'd require two guarantees. There's a form that must be filled to ensure that you're eligible to register um, so you can vote in December 2020. Let me cross over to Dr. Bertha and Dr. Newman Arthur. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good to join you and good to have you join us as well. And Dr. Newman, I'll Thank start off much. with you because uh, this is not the first time we'll be talking about PTSD associated with COVID-19 patients. Now there's a study that is proving that anyone who especially goes into intensive care as a result of COVID-19 is likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, if this is true, of course, as a doctor, I just want to find out that for those people who are intensive care units, are they provided with any form of psychological um, you know, interventions just so that they can better manage the situation when they are out of the hospital? And um, well, I, I think that I should cross over. Dr. Niman. Tell me, I'm sure you are listening to me. Uh, the line is bad, so. Okay, um, what I'm asking, I, can I you hear me clearly now? Yeah, yeah I, can hear, I can hear you. Okay, what I'm saying is that there's been a study that indicates that about 30% of patients who go into intensive care as a result of COVID-19 come back with post-traumatic stress disorder. 
Here in Ghana, what I want to find out is for especially, for especially these people who go into intensive care, uh, whilst they're there or when they're out, is there any form of intervention to ensure that they better deal with PTSD if it should come up eventually? Um, uh, uh, PTSD is one of the major mental health problems. So I think that uh, if, I, if I got your question right, um, now that there is a provision for provision, uh, there's a provision for psychological, uh, some form of psychological services for anybody who is diagnosed with uh, COVID-19 or goes into some form of treatment with COVID-19. So in Ghana, I know Ghana Psychological Association and Ghana Psychological Council have members in all the COVID-19 management teams all over the country to be able to help uh, uh, patients deal with you know, some psychological problems that they may be, be suffering from. So there's, there's that provision for Ghana. Okay, okay. but this but will be the first time that there's been an outbreak of, you know, infectious diseases. Usually, has there been a follow-up, um, you know, screening process just to ensure that these people do not develop? And even if they do, then maybe they can, um, you know, provide them with some treatment. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what is going on at some our various centers, but I know. I'm on one of the of the teams, so I know that uh, some services we discuss all the time, and if anybody has that kind of need, we provide that kind of service. So it's something that that is being done, uh, unless we don't hear about it. But but there's some follow up that goes on all the time with patients who have COVID-19 and have recovered, okay. and they need some form of psychological support. But one would ask, if we say PTSD, what exactly does it mean and how is it related to COVID-19? And Dr. Beth, I'll come to you shortly. I just want Dr. Newman to break it down for us. So well, simply, um, when we say post-traumatic stress, it's sort of post-traumatic. So it means that after a certain unpleasant or traumatic event, people go through a certain kind of stressful situation or state. So a combination of both stress and anxiety, where they relive that event, so they may relive that event, they may have some flashbacks, they would have uh, some nightmares, they may be socially redrawn, any situation that triggers that kind of uh, past event will startle them. So it's more of a, a heightened kind of state or response to everything around you. They can't sleep well, they can't eat well, they become socially red. Hmm. Okay, I think I've just lost Dr. Newman, but Dr. Betha, maybe you can come in at this point. Well, yeah, so post-traumatic stress disorder is just a condition where um, a person has been so traumatized beyond their normal daily routine. It's almost like the, the, the situation puts a stamp on the person's brain so that at any time, if they hear or see something that replicates or reminds them of that event, then they become anxious, worried, and overly reactive. And that has happened in the past in relation to the Liberia war. A lot of the, the Liberians who came to Ghana, anytime they hear a loud noise, they go into a panic mode again. Um, it happened to those who veterans who go to war. Um, and it has happened even in terms of sometimes disease outbreaks. Now, with COVID-19, I think the major trauma is that suddenly you are put in an intensive care unit and unlike regular conditions where your family can visit you, suddenly you are told that nobody can visit you. People come in with what looks like moon, moon appearing suits and you are isolated. Mm. Not only that, you are sick and isolated. So people have thought of, you know, maybe if we can allow FaceTime and Skype and allow people to interact with their families, it would, it would help with the situation. Because like you're quoting in the UK, in China, they also studied people who had been in the ICU and about 90% of them said they were still very, very anxious and had nightmares and bad memories about this, about the whole encounter. If, if this is the case, then Dr. Newman, how do we prepare uh, to deal with the mental challenges that may arise as a result of COVID-19. And I'm asking as a nation, what are some of the measures we should put in place? Um, it, it is not unusual for the nation to focus on the virus and the spread and not mental health because all over the world, uh, mental health re uh, issues relating to any pandemic is, is quite neglected. It's either ignored or neglected because we don't really understand uh, mental health and how it relates to, to general health, uh, health issues. So I think that in all our planning, you know, in terms of funding, in terms of policies, 
uh, when we are building a certain center and all that, our education efforts, all the media engagement and all that, it should be part of, of the discussion mm. all the time. It shouldn't be an afterthought. When things begin to happen, then we think about mental health. Because all over the world, we realize that investment in mental health and you know, related issues is really down. If you look at the number of psychologists even in the country, we are few. Number of psychiatrists and all that, we are few. So in moving forward, I think that for every health-related discussions, mental health issues must be part. Because health... Okay. Oh, quite unfortunate. <laughs> Today we're struggling um, with Dr. Neiman. Let's give him just a little time and then I'll cross over to Dr. Bertha. Dr. Neiman, if you can hear us, just kindly reposition your phone and yes. exactly and go on. Yes. So it should be part of all the discussions going on. So anytime we mention health, part of the discussion should focus on mental health because there is no health without mental health. Mental health is part of health. You know, so that should be the, the, the approach, that should be the, the mindset. Then also we should increase uh, our education on, on mental health issues, even in the country. And so these are some of the things that can help. Anytime there's a training of health professionals or there's a discussion of a certain health policy or there's some education going on somewhere on TV, television, community engagement and all that, there should be some form of discussion on mental health issues. And, and so that would help. Do we have the resources, however? Uh, well, we, we, we dedicate resources to what we think is important. And if we think that mental health is important, then we should find that kind of help. Because if you look at even budget, government budget and all that, uh, even to uh, health, you know, uh, health uh, related issues, you realize that mental health is way down there, right? And mm. if you look at what uh, has been happening with all our psychiatric hospital and all that, I think it's way down there. And so there's, there should be no discussion about health where mental health wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't show up. And I think that if, if we make that our focus and part of our priorities, I think we'll find money for it. Okay, Dr. Bertha, coming back to you, I remember there was a time we had a conversation about uh, the use of neem trees, um, you know, to boost your immune system. And, you know, you did mention that as much as it's not been proven, um, you know, you'd advise that people just relax on inhaling neem tree because they think that that could serve as, a, a, you know, a cure maybe for COVID-19. Yesterday, there was an expose by Anas um, on quack doctors in the country. And I don't know if you've seen it. Have you seen it, by the way? Um, I saw a 15 minute version of it um, I'm on BBC. I didn't actually tune into the TV3 one, okay. but... If, if it's the same, then I saw, I saw parts of it. It is the same. What do you make of the issue concerning uh, local medicine being used as a cure for COVID-19? Well, I mean, clearly what the video showed was that um, the, there was one that was in a clear bottle. It mm. had a lot of toxic stuff. And um, the other one from the man and his father yeah. had E. coli and was not safe. But when I watched it, maybe I've lived in Ghana too long. To me, I was like, what is new? This is what we deal with every day in Ghana. Like, it's not like suddenly COVID-19. And so somebody, the number of times I've come to Ghana and I've watched television and somebody is selling a drug for, for some reason, is hepatitis B in particular. Like, people have treatments for things that you and I know, at least the scientific community knows it does not work. Like growing up, my normal, my initial perception of medicine was that it is sold in buses. There were people who had cures for everything from hernia to ulcers. And somehow you grow up almost believing it. So you go to medical school and you realize that, look, these people are lying. Why are they allowed to peddle these things in buses and everywhere? And unfortunately, our Ghana Medical Association rule says that doctors cannot advertise but these people have no regulation. And so they advertise, they have three hour time slots on major TV channels and they peddle all sorts of things. So to me, I, the person who sent it to me was a, a friend from high school. And I told her that Sandra, what is different? This is what we grew up with. Why is this suddenly new? Mm. So yes, there've been people who've been lying to us all these years and I saw, um, you know, the FDA director say that they, they're, they're relying on reports. So it looks like this FDA is a different one mm. with a new agenda. And so we should keep feeding them information because 
they're not going to be have eyes all over the country. But I think this has been the norm in Ghana. Bella, let's just face it yeah. and not or pretend because it's BBC. People have treatments for all sorts of things mm -hmm. and they sell with impunity and nothing gets done. So we thank Anas for bringing Ghana's situation to the international world. But to me, it was nothing different from what I grew up with. But does it not, um, you know, weaken that, that sector in terms of, um, you know, local drug producers and the fact that maybe we can find a cure eventually, um, you know, from some of our local herbs. But then as a result of this expose, we might delay in coming up with that cure. Well, I think that what we need to do is more education. Like that, that man and his son should have been a little afraid going on any channel to go and talk about something that they know they have not discussed with FD or haven't been given approval. They should not have had the, the, the nerve to put FDA approval on their bottle. But why? do you know why they do it? Mm. Because they know they can get away with it. And until somebody like Anas blows a whistle on them, they would get by with it for many, many months. And so we need to tighten our regulations. We need to let people know, like, they shouldn't be let caught free. They have to be used as an example to let people know that, look, you have the nation's health at risk and so you can't do these things and get away with it mm. so we need people know even the processes do people know what it takes to bring a drug to the market like people were saying oh the madagascar tea let's use it do they know that one it has to be tested for toxicity they have to make sure that the, when the drug comes to the market it's not going to cause pregnant women to abort you know one of the female doctors on there was talking about a man who came and had liver toxicity yeah. from an antiviral drug. Yeah, these are the real dangers. Like, you don't just bring a, a drug to the market. It has to be tested to be sure it's not going to cause kidney failure, liver failure, even encephalopathy. And and people think that, oh, it's just Ghana. In the U.S., too, they've tried vaccines. Mm. In the 70s, they, they introduced a vaccine for poliomyelitis, and it caused immediate what they call Guillain-Barre syndrome. People lost the ability to walk. So... Even in the U.S. and around the world, a drug has to be fully tested for side effects and efficacy before it is brought to the market. So I think we need some education, or maybe that's what we're doing now, to let people know that drugs are not just sold. They are tested before they are made available to the public for use. All right. There's also another, um, you know, update. It says here on Reuters that Chinese researchers warn of a new flu virus found in pigs that has become more infectious to humans and needs to be watched closely in case it becomes a potential pandemic. We're not out of the woods yet with COVID-19. The numbers keep increasing. And already we are being warned about another pandemic. Um, should we be that worried? No, actually, when I read it, I read that report too, and I thought this is just fear mongering. I'm um, like the layers before it gets to humans was I, I think it was just a reporter who wanted to make news because these are the three things, main things in that story. One, she said that there was a new flu virus found in pigs. Mm. It's not uncommon for animals to have their own flu viruses. And then he said that it could be transmitted to humans. It yeah. could. Every virus could be transmitted to humans. So that in itself also is not new. It's a different thing if we prove that, oh my God, one person has been infected with this virus. Then we'll be concerned. And then thirdly, the author also mentioned that it could have pandemic potential because it's not, um, it's new to humans. So I think the person was spinning off of COVID-19, which was new to humans to create some sensation because that in itself, I mean, after I read it, I didn't think it was a danger because okay. it hasn't, it's not been widespread in pigs. They said they found it. It hasn't become widespread in pigs. Mm. It hasn't jumped to the human race. It hasn't caused a pandemic. And I thought, you know, we're dealing with one. Let, let's finish it. And, and talking about the one we're dealing with, yeah. um, to listen with concern that South Africa is running out of beds. Mm. Uh, the United States, all the states who didn't pay attention, um, they are beginning to now close down again with concerns that it's, they will, it will spiral out of control. So I just want to remind Ghanaians that we should not take this virus lightly. If it had happened in South Africa, it can also happen in Ghana. 
and that we should not be lax at all. Like we saw Italy, we're seeing America, we think, oh, God, Africa is safe. But if South Africa is now struggling for bets, and we were also at a point where our bed capacity was going down, so we had to change our testing guidelines and discharge people home. So we have to we have to realize that we're not out of the woods at all, and that if it happens to South Africa, it can happen to us as well. Absolutely. Finally, before I let you go, a little advice. We've officially started the compilation of the new voters register, and you know people are stepping out to register. It's very important as we prepare for the 2020 elections. Uh, the EC has also said that, you know, they are making sure to adhere uh, strictly to the safety precautions. But, I mean, what would you say about this situation and what people can further do to protect themselves? I think my comment to that is that I would say remember Burundi. Um, Burundi was about to have elections and the World Health Organization warned them that you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. They should be careful. And unfortunately, not only did they not listen, they kicked the World Health Organization out. And you know what happened, right? Mm -hmm. The person got sick and died, uh, and his mother died. The, yeah. the who finally won the election was in the ICU from COVID-19. And I don't know what became of him, but um, we have to be cognizant of the fact that there is a pandemic going on. Um, anytime I was telling somebody that this virus is like an angry man, he's in a corner waiting. Anytime you, you try to pretend like it doesn't exist, it gets really, really mad and starts misbehaving. So much as we want to win elections and we want to retain power, we have to put, uh, you know, the right precautions in place and realize that, look, some things can wait. And if it can um, we should let it do so. Mm. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Bertha. Um, always a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. And Dr. Bertha Sewa Ayi is an infectious disease specialist. Earlier, we also spoke to Dr. Isaac Newman Arthur, who is a clinical psychologist. Now, still talking about the compilation of the new voters register, our correspondents are positioned in various parts of the country to update us on whether we're adhering to the safety protocols and how it's going so far. And so, Evans Inkum will be speaking to us from the Ashanti region. We also have um, the birthday girl, Grace Hamo Asari. Uh, she's coming to us from the EC offices and Ododo Diodo. And also, we'll have Eric Yaweje, as usual representing the western region and he'll give us some updates on that and armstrong gold alogbe uh, is also in accra and so he speaks to us He's coming to us from the ec office um i think and also um from ododo diorio constituency i'll start off with williams evans in Coombe. good morning good morning bella all right um i hope you're well tell us where are you which uh polling station are you at the moment and what can you tell us Evans, can you hear me? Okay, uh, just a bit of struggle, but uh, the exercise has officially commenced. Uh, people started queuing as early as I think 5 a.m., especially for people who were looking to quickly register and go to work. And so if you're yet to go, remember that, um, you know, the, the EC says that you can only register. Well, we'll be right back quickly. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. Let's cross over to the Western region now. Eric Yawaje is on standby. Good morning. Good morning, Bella. All right. Thank you for joining us. Must be a very hot uh, day in the Western region. But tell us, where exactly are you and what's happening there? Uh, thank you very much, Bella. I just left one of the centers at the um, FIA constituency here in the FIA Questioning Municipal Assembly of the Western Region. I'm on, actually on the move to a different um, polling center. But, Bella, I can report that so far, all the places that I've been to, the exercise has been very smooth. Um, as at um, 6 o'clock, when we started our rounds, um, some of the centers that we visited, um, people had already formed long queues mm. waiting for the exercise to begin at 7. Um, for instance, when I got to one center at uh, Kwesimin team, mm. I counted about 70 people who had already gathered for the, before 7 o'clock. So it tells you how eager people are to get their cars ahead of the 
2020 general elections. And I must also report that um, the places that I've been to, there have been uh, there are a number of the PPEs in place. We have also the various safety protocols in place. On the various floors, you see that there are demarcations to ensure that the applicants uh, respect the two meter distance rule. Okay. Again, I also saw that um, the, apparently the, there's, a, there's an arrangement of a sort with the Ghana Health Services or something. So I saw some nurses at the yes. Kwesimi team government hospital who have been deployed to almost all the centers that I visited. So, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, when I got to the King, Christ the King Parish Church at uh, Efia, I saw about four of the nurses there with thermometer yeah. guns checking the temperature of the various um, applicants. Okay. So I can say that here in the Western region, things are smooth, except that, Bella, at the main point where you are made to register, mm -hmm. the protocols are okay. But what they are doing is that they, they have this caution tape that has cordoned off the main registration center. Mm. Outside that tape, you see a lot of people there, and they are not um, obeying the fiscal distance rule. So mm. if, yes, so if there's going to be a problem, then it's going to be from that end. But are these people in the nose places, masks, by the way? Well, some of them are in nose masks. Some of them are not in nose masks. That is what is troubling. And there's but no then, security um, to at least ensure that even though they are gathered there, they would adhere to the social distancing protocols, and if they don't have nose masks, they'll be sent away? Bella, it appears that the main concentration is where the center is. Mm. Away from the center, there's little uh, attention there. So you see um, security men around, but their attention is actually at where the action is and not outside the perimeter that has been set at the various centers that I visited, Bella. Hmm, that's that's a uh, you know cause for concern, but I really do hope that something is done about it. I know that uh, yesterday the EC chair mentioned that uh, they were deploying about seven thousand health assistants in the various polling centres just to ensure that people adhere to the safety protocol. So I guess it's not surprising that you're seeing some nurses, um, you know, help out with that as well. But also, uh, let me see if I can quickly cross over to William Evans Incum and then I'll come back to you, William. What about you? Where are you at the moment and what can you tell us? I see that there's order um, behind you and the process is going on smoothly. Tell us more. Well, absolutely. As you can see, there's absolute order. I mean, it has been a very smooth process here in the Freeman Hotel polling station. All the safety protocols have been or are being observed. And I can tell you that there's um, all the measures that have to be put in place to ensure that uh, the receiver and also the taker or the, 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 the one giving out the card, I'm talking about the EC officials here, and then the potential electorate are not, none of these guys is actually at risk. Mm -hmm. Now, let me just run you through the entire process. So when you get here, you are supposed to uh, wash your hands, and Veronica Bucket has been positioned advantage to place okay. just to welcome any possible, I mean, electorate. Then, when you get here, the thermometer gun is also pointed at your forehead just to uh, gauge your temperature and see if there's any suspicion. Mm. Uh, beyond that, well, there hasn't been any suspicion so far. Beyond okay. that, uh, you can see there's, I mean, there's in, the seating um, arrangement is very spatial, so mm. I can't. Okay. Um, well, yes, yeah, so that's William Evans Incum uh, updating us there. But let me just quickly cross over um, to Eric and Jay to find out. Eric, uh, so have there been issues where there's been a challenge with guarantors, um, you know, helping out some people who may not have the documents um, to show that they are eligible? So, Bella, I, I can count that I've visited about um, close to 14 of the centres and in all instances, it was only at the Baptist Church at number nine, traffic lights, where I saw an elderly person around, and she apparently didn't come with any form of identification. Mm. So it's essentially, probably she, she was waiting for somebody to guarantee for her. Apart from that center, all the places that I visited, most of the applicants came with um, Ghana card. Okay. Bella. 
All right, going back to you, uh, William, uh, you're back. So I just want to find out as well, any challenges with people who would have to guarantee for someone who may come without an ID card? Well, so far, there hasn't been any challenges. Um, almost all the people that I've seen um, here uh, either have a passport or um, a NIA national card. identification card to prove their eligibility as okay. far as showing to these electoral officers that indeed you are a Ghanaian and for that matter you can vote uh, as the constitution requires mm. um, its concern. I mean, this is a, a middle class area. So uh, averagely, any resident likely is likely to have a passport or an, an NIA. So um, it is not too much of a pro problematic to the electoral officers here. I mean, they are enjoying a very smooth exercise okay. as far as um, this process. Okay. All right. I see also that there's a thermometer gun. And so that is also being checked before, um, you know, you're allowed to take a seat. And so uh, coming back to you, um, Eric J. So again, you said you're moving to the next center. But really, what is the atmosphere like? Is it a calm atmosphere generally um, in the Western region? It is. It is, uh, Bella. Like I explained, uh, I've been to a number of the polling centers and you could see that people are excited to get new cars for the upcoming 2020 general elections. I interacted with a lady who just had a card and she was so happy. And mm. what happened was that she tells me that she spends not less than six minutes. So she's happy that actually when she was coming from the house, she thought that she would keep long at the center. So. That was the reason why she came to the center before 6 a.m. this morning. But mm. when she finally had to go through the process, it was very smooth for her. And like I said, she spent a um, time of six minutes. Mm. So that's, um, that's, I think that's commendable. And what I also observed, Bella, is the fact that all the centers that I visited, it mm. is only a party agent for the National Democratic Congress, the NBC, and the New Patriotic Party, the MPP, yeah. that were visible. For the other parties, I didn't see any where all, at all the 14 and more centers that, that I visited. visited. Bella. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Williams, coming back to you briefly before we wrap up. And so, uh, moving on, I know that you'll be visiting other centers as well. Um, you know, basically, what is the atmosphere like? Because I asked Eric earlier, and he says it's pretty calm. You say you're in the middle class, um, you know, um, environment. So it looks like everything is calm. But generally, what are people saying about, um, you know, their interest in registering, if you can hear me? Well, I think I've just lost him, unfortunately. So uh, I believe our time is up. We might have to wrap up at this moment. Let me quickly read some messages um, that were sent onto my phone. So, um, you know, these people will not be left out of the conversation. Um, Okay, so this one says that, hello, Bella, some of us have been contact traced and we were positive. We were asked to stay at home. No test conducted on my immediate family, my husband and two kids. I was given prescription on WhatsApp, which I bought and I'm still taking. Now, are we part of the discharge or recoveries or are we active cases? And that's question number one. Two says, who bears the cost of medication, which was more than 100 Ghana CDs? And three, I don't have enough money on me and still being asked to stay at home. I think situations like this uh, sh won't help but cause people not to self-quarantine. This is an anonymous texter. A very interesting observation there. And... Um, We'll talk about stigmatization as well uh, shortly because this one says, Hello, Bella and Anita, please. We beg the NCCE and the Ghana Health Service to intensify education on stigmatization and discrimination, especially at our workplaces. Even the elites, directors and head of departments uh, do this to their recovered staff openly. After recovery, our bosses don't want us to return to work, but ask us to go home till further notice, claiming that we have not recovered yet. This is G from Kasua. So tomorrow we'll be talking extensively uh, about this particular issue, stigmatization, on TV3 New Day, and I'm sure we'll extend it to COVID-19 360. If you also have experience 
any such situation, let us know. Visit us on social media at TV3 Ghana. And um, we'll throw some light on that tomorrow. Thank you to our correspondents uh, for speaking to us and expect more of such coverages um, in our subsequent bulletins. This has been COVID-19 360. My name is Bella Mundi. I've been doing this with Anita Ekufu. And God willing, we'll be back tomorrow to update you more on the situation. Enjoy your day and keep watching TV3.